good morning, everybody. We are excited to be able to jump into the finale of this series, Off the Chain. Hey, let me just ask you a question. Has this, been, has this been helpful for you over the past four weeks, kind of talking about how we can be free from strongholds? Awesome, man. I, I am I'm so, so hopeful. I've been praying to that point, you know, that, that God would use this series of messages, really coupling that with our 21 days of prayer and fasting. And man, it has been an incredible 21-day journey. Uh, and for me, fasting is over. Um, you know, and it's not that I'm like, Jesus, I'm so happy to be done with that. But um, <laughs> food is delicious, man. It really is. And I'm much more thankful for it these days. Uh, so if you are watching online with us, we want to say welcome to you. If you're watching from anywhere around the world, you can always jump on to our website, to peakcity.church forward slash messages. You'll see that link right here below me on the screen right there. And you can follow that if, uh, if you're watching from a social media page or something to that effect. And all the messages in the past in this series, you'll find there as well, church fam. So you can jump on and see them there. Now, We've been walking through a verse of scripture every single week is the kind of the theme verse for what we've been dealing with in terms of the strongholds we've talked about. Last week, we talked about uh, really a subject that needs to be addressed in church. We talked about sexual strongholds. And the week before that, we talked about the stronghold of addiction. And we've been walking through these things. And like I said before, we could do a 40-week series. Just pick a stronghold, and we could preach about it. But we've been operating through what the scripture tells us in terms of how to be free and we've been using this as a baseline scripture. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. Also, note takers, if you don't take notes on your phone and you like to write stuff down, but you forget something to write with, we actually have a note-taking card now. If you need one, our usher can get it to you. You can actually just wave like this, and she'll hand you one. Um, and they're available to you every Sunday if you need it. So you can get them when you walk in the door. The Bible says, for though we walk in the flesh... We're not waging war according to the flesh. In other words, it, this, is, this is not just a physical battle we're in. Say it with me. It's spiritual. Oh, some of you guys have been here the past couple of weeks. It's spiritual, right? So for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. You ask the question, what's a stronghold? We talk about this every week. It's, it's that thing that you can't kick. It's that thing that you keep coming back to time and time and time again. And we talked about it in this sense. We, we basically said a couple of weeks back and subsequently last week, if you think about the one thing that you struggle with most, like that one thing that just is a part of your character that you wish was not there, like I, I just I hate this part of me, God, I want you to take it away, and you're constantly laying that same sin or that same stronghold and struggle down at the feet of Jesus, do you know why you keep doing it? And we talked about it. I know the answer, and many of you do now as well. It's because you love it. That is why. It's not because it's something that your parents did, or, you know, your granddad and your dad did, and you do. It's not, your, you know, well, my mama was this way, and her mama. And I, you can't blame anybody else. When it comes to strongholds, it's, it's not just like an affinity kind of thing. It's a love thing. It's, it's not just a, I'm experimenting, kind of, it's a passion thing. That's why you keep coming back to whatever that struggle is, all right? But the good news is that the Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they are made with divine power to destroy strongholds. You can back up a slide right there if you want to go. There we go. There we go. Divine power to destroy strongholds. So how do we destroy them? Not on your own, Okay. First things first, it all comes from God. It is his power working in and through you. This isn't something that you can just kind of day by day say, okay, I'm going to put that away. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Because in those moments, all you're thinking about is the thing that you're trying to avoid. And what you've stepped into is behavior modification. And behavior modification only puts a Band-Aid on symptoms. And over time, they keep coming back. Because roots go down deep when it comes to strongholds. And they will root themselves in your life. And you know how it goes. When you cut a weed with deep roots, what does it do? It comes back. That's right. It grows back. Because what God wants for us is to capture our heart. And what he knows is when he captures the heart of a woman or of a man, and they hunger and they long so much to know him more than anything else. And he becomes the sole center of their desire. And everything else that was trying and competing to sit on the throne of their hearts, saying, I want to be first. 
I want to be first. I want to have control. I want to be that thing that, that, that rules your life. And when you take that stuff and say, take a back seat. I'm sitting Jesus in the first place, and the throne of my heart belongs to him. All of a sudden, we see these strongholds begin to die. Like John Piper said, when it comes to sin, you don't treat it. You don't push it away. You kill it. Because what you starve dies, but what you feed thrives. So what are you feeding, right? So this is the theme verse for the scriptures. Uh, we define strongholds this way. It comes from a word in the Greek, and it literally means a prisoner locked by deception. In other words, you're caught, you're trapped in something that's not even real, okay? You may have really had something in the past that, that was real, and you dealt with it, and you struggled with it, but it's so affected you that it carries you to this day, and you think that you're still struggling, and you're still bound by that, like the illustration of the elephant. Remember we said an elephant, when they, when they want to train it to travel with the circus, they put a huge chain around its leg. They attach it to a massive stake that's in the ground held by concrete, and the elephant can't be free. That massive animal is, is bound by it. Within two to three weeks, they can remove that chain and tie a rope around its leg and put a small stake in the ground, and that elephant will not step away. It won't flee because it believes that it is bound. It has become a prisoner trapped by deception. Satan uses the same kind of idea for the strongholds in our lives. He makes us think that something is a certain way to keep us bound. I could never do that because of what happened in my past. Like, I, I wish that I had lived life differently then so that I could do more for God now, but I can't right? These are lies from the enemy. These are prisons of deception. And God is saying that we can absolutely be free from these things. So today, what we're going to talk about is something that, that, uh, that is so, so very relevant for everybody in the room. Another, another definition is living life by something that's not true, right? Don't define yourself by what somebody calls you. Live your life knowing that you are who God says you are. When we talked about this, like the person that's been clean and sober for 25 years, and they're like, I'm a drug addict, but I've been clean and sober for 25 years. Praise God. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Why are we praising God? Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm a Christ follower. I'm a Christian. Okay. Well, if that's the case for you, then you are not what you said that you were. Because what Jesus says is when he enters the heart of a man or a woman, he makes all things new. The Bible doesn't say, behold, I make some things new. No. Jesus said, I make what new? All. all things new. He says that he takes the old and it is gone. And then the new has come. And in Christ, you are no longer a sinner. Believe it or not, you may still struggle with sin. But Jesus says that you are a saint if his spirit lives within you. That you are not the addict that you once were. Forgiven, you are blood bought. And you are a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ. And you are who God says you are. Right? Hey, church. Uh, we, thank you, because you know I'll preach faster if you amen me more, right? So don't, don't forget, you can respond to the preacher, all right? So this week, what are we talking about? We're talking about the stronghold of fear. We're going to talk about the stronghold of fear. Now, this is something that on some level, to some degree, we've all been there. I think every single one of us, unless you're Dave Mira and you've got that weird brain thing going on where your fear center is gone, and you're riding bikes and jumping them over the, United, you know, the uh, Empire State Building or something, we've all dealt with fear. It's a, it, you know, it can be a healthy thing. It can be a very unhealthy thing. We think about fear, and we think about that word, and we think about some of the most famous quotes that have ever been shared. And I think the most famous one was during the Great Depression by Franklin D. Roosevelt. Remember this one? He said, the only thing that we have to fear is what? fear itself. He continues, he says, nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. He says, that's what fear is. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror that paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. How many of you have ever come to a place but because of fear, you just stopped, not moving forward. You knew, you knew that what that was could have been one of the best things for you. It could have been a risk that was worth taking, something that you look back on now and you're steeped with regret, but you got up to the line, fear grips your heart, and you said, no, I'm not, I'm just not, I'm just not. I think we've all been there. 
sounds like something that we need to see what the Word of God says that we can be free from. So psychology actually talks about fear quite a bit. So what is fear? How do we define it? If you look, and this, this comes up all throughout the scriptures here. I'm talking, it shows up, the word fear or afraid occurs 330 times in the Bible. The Bible has a lot to say about fear. The word fear or related words to that, they show up 330 times, and the word afraid itself is found over 200 times. And in fact, in Psalms alone, the word fear is found 53 times. The Bible has a lot to say about this. So in the, in the Greek and the New Testament, when we see the word fear, this will look a little familiar to you. It's this word phobos. Phobos, where we get the word phobia from, right? The actual definitive word, the Latin that we get for fear, phobia. Phobos, it comes from the Greek. Psychology frequently uses this word when it refers to fears. Phobia, let's define phobia. This is a psychological definition a scholarly definition, and it says, basically, phobia is a fear that has no basis in fact, right? Like claustrophobia. You're afraid to walk into a space that's confined because you feel like you're not going to be able to get out. Okay, now you're subjecting something to that closet that you're standing in that has no lock on it. It's an unjustified fear. Right? You may have never been bitten by a dog in your life, but you have got this fear of dogs because you're afraid that they could hurt you. You've never fallen off of a tall building and smacked on the ground, but yet you've got a fear of heights. Right? You've never crashed on an airplane, but you've got a fear of flying because you know other people have. I've heard other people have been bitten by dogs, have fallen from tall places, have crashed in airplanes, so I'm afraid. It's an unjustified, for you, it is an unjustified, justified fear that has really no basis for your life in fact. That's what phobias are. In fact, the Greek god Phobos was called upon to frighten enemies. And this is where we get the word from. It's a Greek mythological figure. Fear, really, it's, it's, based, on, it's based on the possibility, not necessarily the probability, of an event occurring in your life. So to be fearful in your mind of what seems possible makes it seem probable. And if you're a creative kind of person, like if you're, you're creative, it is very easy to get lost and gripped by the stronghold of fear. It's natural for you. Like if you're kind of an artsy kind of person, an expressive person that looks for creative outlets to express that part of your personality, because you're a dreamer, because you think things constantly, all of a sudden it's easy for you to connect dots that should have never been connected. And it's so easy for you to get sucked in to the stronghold of fear. Some of you people in the seats right now, you're, you're, you're nodding because I know that you're agreeing with what I'm talking about here. It's just the way you're wired. But God says you don't have to live in that, that you can be free from that. So I want to tell you some of the truths about fear. Number one, fear is the enemy of the fruit of the Spirit. Especially love. What does the Bible say that love does? It says perfect love casts out fear. You see, it's an enemy to the fruit of the Spirit. Fear affects every area of a person's life. Listen, in some way, the decisions that you make for yourself or for your family can be affected by fear. And if fear is a stronghold, it is heavily dictating your decision making. Fear of the unknown. Fear of a lack of stability. Fear of change. Come on, somebody. You can say amen or oh me to that if you want to. Everybody says, oh, I don't mind change. Yeah, as long as you're the one that's making the change, right? <laughs> but if you're getting something that's being changed for you, mm -mm, you are not a happy camper. That's right. But this is fear that affects these decisions when these things happen. Here's another truth about fear. People can be free from fear. It does not have to rule you. You can be free from this. Here's another truth. Fear is emotional turmoil. Anyone that's really struggled with this, they can share this better than me or anybody else. Man, I was so encouraged. I read, I read a story a couple weeks back from somebody in our church that shared how they were, they were set free from this, uh, this stronghold of fear and anxiety. And it's such a powerful, powerful testimony about what God can do to free somebody from emotional turmoil. Here's another truth about fear. Fear prevents people from going on with their lives. It basically, it puts you in a holding pattern, right? Yeah? Okay, and, and think about it. If that's the truth, it sounds a whole lot like 
a prisoner that's locked by deception, right? This is what fear is. Robert Burton said this about fear. He said, people who live in fear grow up standing at the end of every line. Actually, that was Dennis Whitley that said that. People who grow up living in fear grow up standing at the end of every line. Here's another one. They that live in fear are never free. God doesn't want you to stay bound. He wants you to be able to break off the chain of the stronghold of fear into his freedom that he has for you, and you can be free. I believe that today you can be free from the stronghold of fear. Now, how, how fear is created is pretty interesting, and I think the better we understand how fear begins to rise up and get stronger in our lives, the more we'll be able to see it when the enemy's trying to weave some things together so that we can say, you know what, no, I don't receive that into my life anymore. So I want to give you a simple recipe for fear. Here's four ingredients of what make up fear in the life of a believer. Number one, our limited knowledge of the future. Come on, right? Not being able to predict something when something's new, you're stepping into it for the first time. When things are unpredictable, what do you do? You cling to stability. Even if it puts you at a loss, you'll hold on to something that you know the outcome of before you step into something that could potentially be better because you're afraid of what the outcome could be. Well, I, I could fail. This could do something to not work out for me. You see, our limited knowledge of the future is a recipe, an ingredient in the recipe of fear. Number two, the creative capacity of our mind. You creatives out there. When it comes to your ability to cognate and to dream something up, to make a scenario up in your head that makes you go, nope, that's why you don't get in the water when you go to the beach. Jaws is not going to jump out from on top of the pier, swallow you, and swim off with his dinner. You know, you got to be free from that. But in your mind, you're like, mm-mm, I'm not getting in that water. The jellyfish is going to get on my face and suffocate me and sting me to death under the water. I'm going to get caught in a rip current, and the lifeguards are not going to see me. I'm going to be fish food. No, I'm going to the pool, but only the shallow end, because everybody knows what can happen in the deep end. You know, that, it's fear that does that. The creative mind, the creative capacity of our mind can cause us to fall into fear. Number three, a painful past event. Something that happened in your past that was damaging, that was scarring to you, that left you feel, with a feeling of trauma can cripple you in your future. Because anytime you get near anything that even resembles it, you want to run away. Hey, listen, how about this? I was a student pastor for 12 years, and there was a child that was in my student ministry. He was a teenager, sweet, sweet guy. He, was, uh, he had high-functioning autism, did fantastic in our student ministry. Uh, and there was a false accusation made by someone that attended our church that they were a sexual predator. It was completely unfounded and untrue, all right? And it wasn't even this broad stroking one. I've seen, I've seen stories like this in the media that have re literally ruined people's reputations, destroyed their friendships and relationships with their family and their job situation, and was completely untrue, proven by the courts that it was untrue. I've seen that. In this situation, it was just a false accusation that someone made. And you know how smaller churches are. This was a church about, of, of about 200 people, man. It went through that church like wildfire. And because the parents heard this rumor, they took their son and they left the church and they never came back ever again, even though it was completely untrue. Why? Why? Because past events that are traumatic, they can put a root of fear in your heart that can make someone think, you know what, oh, it's going to go right back to what we experienced in the past, and I'm going to run and I'm going to flee from the very sight or appearance of something that I had to deal with in the past. It's real. This is something that we really deal with, and this is not a criticism. This is, this is the building blocks of what makes up fear. I hope this is helping you this morning. Number four, the threat of harm. If, if you could get hurt, you know, there's, I know there's tons of parents out there like me. I kind of huddle over my babies, you know, especially when they're learning to walk. I've got one that's crawling right now that wants to stick his hands in his mouth and then stick his fingers in anything that he can find, like the sockets on the wall. So we keep those little plastic plugs in everything to protect him. But if he goes anywhere near it, I'm walking right over and I'm checking the wall to make sure I'm not going to have fried baby in my house. You know what I mean? That, that's just the way, that's the way I am. I love my child. I don't want him to get hurt. But the threat of harm can cripple somebody. Listen, in ways that, that aren't just like sensible, okay, I, you know what, I'm not going to stand over an open flame with gasoline because, you know, that, not, not stuff like that. Not the crazy, you should, you should actually know better kind of things. Because that's good, healthy reservation there. 
But things like, I could never send my teenager on that missions trip because they're flying out of the country. What if something happens to them? You see what's happening now? Fear is crippling you in a way that you're keeping something that God wants to do in the life of your child that will forever change them and forever remold and reshape their heart to be burdened for a world that exists outside of the one that they've been raised in because of your fear. You see, the enemy wants to use that to keep you from stepping into what God's purpose and God's destiny is for you and even the ones that you have responsibility for. So that's a recipe for fear. Let's talk about some lies about fear. These are some of the lies that we see when it comes to what fear is. And we often say these to ourselves, right? And a lot of this is rooted and based in fear, but we don't think that it's fear. We don't. We excuse it some other way. We want to say things like, we look at, oh, you know what, I, I, uh, there's things that I'm not going to do because my ability lacks there. I don't have the mental faculties. I don't, we give excuses. Really what it is is fear. You're not applying to get into school because you have a fear of rejection. You're not taking a step trying to get that new job or move towards that new career because you're afraid that it's going to fail. And we tell ourselves things all the time. Here's some lies about fear. Number one, everybody say this with me. We throw it up on the screen here. Say it with me. I can't. Come on. We say this all the time. I can't. The worst thing about the I can't lie is that it stops us before we even start. Like we don't even start moving in the direction of something because we immediately shut it down saying, no, nope, I can't do it. And we give ourselves every excuse that we can find to make ourselves agree with that statement. That is a lie. That is a lie from Satan. The Bible says it clearly that if God is for you, who can be against you? I love this scripture. We misquote it all the time. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Listen, I'm not even gonna, I'm not kidding around. There was a young man that got saved years back in a, in a ministry that I was a part of. And he, gave, he came to Jesus in a radical way. He was a frat guy, and he was like one of the, the leaders. It's funny, you call like these frat guys, these students leaders, but he was a leader in his fraternity. And literally, he was so just radically shaken up by, by the grace of God. He gave his life to Jesus. Jesus was doing a real work in his life, but later that week, he was at a frat party doing what frat guys do, and it involved a keg stand. And literally, he said, man, I just kept thinking about that scripture you shared last week. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No, brother, no. <laughs> like, oh, man. <laughs> he's, hey, hey, he is, he is on fire to this day, and he is loving and serving God, and he looks back at that, and he chuckles because I never let him forget it. Uh, ever, 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 never let him forget that. But actually, that verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, is specifically about Paul learning to handle both plenty and poverty without being distracted from his life's purpose by either. You see, when Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, what he's saying is, circumstance, you don't dictate what God says I'm called to do. Church, hear this right now. Doesn't matter how hard or easy life is for you, if you feel a burden in your heart for something, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you and the circumstances that surround you, your family, your income, your education level, your whatever, you name it. It does not. When you stack that up against the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life, it pales in comparison. I can't is a lie from the enemy. Here's another one. God won't. Oh, we use this one a lot, don't we? When it comes to the fear that we deal with in our lives, we say this, God won't help me. Or God, how about this one, God won't forgive me again. It's just too much water under the bridge. Listen, if you truly feel that way, you don't fully understand what grace is. Because the Bible I read says where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. God will forgive. God has forgiven. How can we look at the finished work of the cross of Jesus Christ and what Jesus did there to pay for all of the sin of the world and somehow with your sin in your life, somehow you think, oh, it's just too much. I've just, I've, I've emptied out the grace cup. Everything that Jesus did on the cross, it was good for everybody else up until now and I spent all the rest of that grace. No, no, no. That is a lie from the enemy. God won't hear me. God won't love me. Listen, these are real cries from hurting people, and many of us have thought these things and said these things before. 
This is not a criticism of you. This is what we do every week here in this series when we talk about the lies of the enemy. Because if we're going to tear down strongholds, what do we do? We expose the lie and we replace it with God's truth. And that is what we're doing. And if you believe this lie that says that God won't help, God won't be there, God won't. I'm telling you right now, you need to understand for yourself that God will and God can. He took Peter. Remember Peter? Pastor Peter, who he himself was the one who stepped out of the boat and saw some of the most miraculous power of God working through a person in a supernatural, just you know, laws of physics bending kind of way. The man saw Jesus walking on water, and he said, Lord, if it's you, bid me come. And Jesus said, come on, buddy. Come on out. And you know what he did? He, Peter, it doesn't say, and Jesus lifted his foot and drug it out of the boat. No, that's not what the Bible says. It says, and Peter stepped out of the boat. And when he did, it was met with the miraculous power of God. And he walked on water, something that no other man other than the Son of God had ever done. And this is the same guy that denied his Savior, the guy, the guy that gave him the power literally to walk on the waves. Like, there's no questioning in his mind that he's God, that he comes from God, that he is God, that he is fully God and fully man. And yet, when it came to his trial and his crucifixion, where was Peter? He was gone. Denied his Lord three times. Denied Christ three times. And yet that same God who was denied, that did this miraculous power and worked through him, even when he was there with him in the flesh, embraced him and forgave him. God will forgive you. Don't you believe that lie for a second? God will forgive you. How about this one? Nobody cares. Mm. Nobody cares about me. Nobody cares about what I think. Nobody cares about what I do. I'm not appreciated. See, this is a lie that comes from Satan, the accuser himself. Much too close to the first recorded lie in the scriptures. When, when he deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden here, his approach to Eve was that God didn't have her best interest at heart. God doesn't really care about you. If he did, then you'd know everything that God knows, right? Sound familiar? And the enemy would want you to think nobody cares, including God. Let's see what the Bible says about this. When it comes to thinking that God doesn't care about you, remember the words of Romans 8.32. It says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? This is who your God is. He is the God that loves you so much that he wasn't willing to let you die lost in your sin. But rather, he was willing to let his own son lay his life down for you. Can you imagine the enormity and the agony of you watching your child give their life for someone else? This is how much our God cares about you. 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 The person that says nobody cares. Listen, and people care too. It's natural to retreat from people when we hurt. It's natural to hide, to isolate ourselves. It's natural, but it's counterproductive. And that's not the way that God wants us to live our lives. I'm telling you, you need people. You need people. Listen, this past week we had an event called Group Link. It was fantastic. We actually saw a new young adults group form. We got a new young adults leader. His name's Wade Olive. You saw him playing the bass this morning. He's sitting in the back of the house right here. If you're anywhere, yeah, fantastic. We've got a group for brand new believers called Starting Point that you can join. So that's, that's, there's, there's like about 10 different groups, opportunities. If you want to join a group, you go down to guest services and ask. You can talk to Pastor John's wife, Shallery, who's coordinating all of our city groups ministry. We're going to have all this online probably by the end of this coming week so you can see all these groups. But you need people. Because when you tell yourself this lie that nobody cares, all of a sudden if you've got a group of people around you that care, it's hard to believe it, Right? Listen, the, the best recipe to see that lie torn down in your life is to get yourself in a group of people that are genuinely going to want to know you and your story. Not so you have to bear your soul to them, but so that you can know that you've got a friend out there somewhere. God did not design you to do life alone. Lone rangers are dead rangers. Don't do it by yourself and think that that's the way you should do it. Jesus didn't do that. He had 12 guys surrounding him all the time. And then among those, there were three that were his closest friends. 
And he's calling us to the same kind of fellowship. And if you want to believe that somebody cares about you, get in a group of people that you're doing life with every week, and then you start to care about them and they you. And the magic thing about care is this. It's not something that's taught. Care is caught. You understand? Care is something, something that grips your heart, a cause or a person or a story or something. And the, the beauty of it is you don't have to teach people that care how to care. And so if you're surrounding yourselves with people like that, and we've got a place for you to do that, this lie that comes up that says nobody cares will be struck down. You'll be able to look at that and say, no, that is a lie from Satan. I don't receive that into my heart. How about this one? I don't matter. It's a lie from the enemy right there. I don't matter. Some of us at some point in time have said this. I don't matter. I'm going to be real quick with this one. You matter to God. For God so loved the world, that includes you, that he gave his only son, only, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent his son into the world not to condemn you, not to condemn you in the midst of your sin and your strongholds and your struggles, not to condemn you, not to condemn the world, but that the world through Jesus might be saved. You matter to God. Don't you ever forget that. Some of you may be on the brink struggling with anxiety and depression and just thinking that the world would be better off without you. That is a lie from Satan. I am crying out from my heart to yours. Don't believe that lie. Don't you dare believe that lie. There are people that you don't even understand that you are profoundly impacting with your life. The life that you think isn't worth anything is the life that Jesus died to keep with him in all of eternity because you matter. And God has a profound purpose for your life. How about this lie? It's too late. We've talked about this one before. It's too late. Ah, as I'm too old. I should have started earlier. This is powerful. This is powerful because the feeling of urgency which should prompt us into action becomes his tool to intensify despair and fear. Oh, I could have done so much more had I started years ago. Or too much water has passed under the bridge for that relationship to be healed. If only I had done this before so-and-so passed away or moved away or, or before I lost that job or before my pay rate was cut or it's too late. This is a lie of the enemy. Again, take it's too late. Take where you are right now in your life. If you're still sucking air right now, and then stack that up next to an almighty, all-powerful, all-loving, all-knowing God, what can God do through your life now? I believe that if you surrender all of it to him now in this moment, he can do more in the latter days than he did in the former. Listen, there's a time and a season for everything, too. Some of us say, I wish I'd gotten to this sooner. Listen, there is a process that God has for your life. For those of you that have been walking with Jesus for a long time, and you're saying, if only I'd gotten to this place sooner, don't argue with God's timing. If you've been trying to surrender your heart and walk with him and follow the steps he has for you, don't despise the days of small things and understand that there's process before you get to the place where you're harvesting the seeds that you, so you so had had sown. Grammar police, help me with that, okay? The seeds that you had sown. Sometimes there's pain in the process. But we don't look and we don't say, ah, oh, it's too late. Listen, it's never too late for God. I'm so glad that the thief on the cross didn't look and say, well, I can't pop myself off this thing and get baptized, so I guess it's too late. I'm just going to go ahead for my crimes and my sin, let myself keep my mouth shut and die and go to hell. Yet there was a God that changed everything as he hung dying beside him on the cross that said, this day you will be with me in paradise. There's parables that Jesus told about how people come in at the final hour and they're able to receive and be received by the bridegroom. You don't look at time, this thing that God created and say, there's not enough of it left for me, for God to do anything through me. That is a lie from the enemy. It's never too late. We talked about this weeks back. We said, when's the best time to plant a tree? Some of you want to say 20 years ago. That is Satan. That is the enemy lying to you. The best time to plant a tree is right now. Sow your seeds wisely. Don't believe the lie of the enemy. 
So we're going to talk about three fears and we're done. These things I think we all deal with. And so I want to unpack this. I'm going to move kind of quick through this last portion here. So if you're a note taker, jot them down. If you're not, you can always go back online and check the message out and jot them down as you watch it again because I move too fast. Uh, but I wanted to give you three fears that we need to overcome. And then we're going to land the plane today. Number one, the fear of rejection. Right? This will keep us from doing a lot of things. Hey, uh, you know, hey, single people, wave at me. All, all the single people in the house, wave at me. All right, I want you guys to all look around the room real quick. Everybody, while you're waving, look around the room. Just have a look. All right? Uh, I might have gotten you, you know, a little, uh, a little conversation at the end of church today. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> there are moments in time where you can step out in faith or in fear. And if we, if we actually allow fear to be the thing we step into, we step away from what God would have for us. Listen, there are awesome opportunities that surround us all the time, and we feel something pull on our hearts to move in a certain direction, and we allow fear to talk us out of this thing because we think we'll fail. We think that we will be rejected. We think that, you know, I, I, if, I, if I put myself out there for somebody, I'm just going to get my heart stepped on, so I'm just not going to do it, right? Because you've been hurt before, and past hurts are a recipe to build what? Fear, right? And so because of that, we have this fear of rejection. Listen, the Bible says it like this. I'm going to read this a few times. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us the spirit of, say it with me, fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You see, and rejection wants to trap us, this fear that we have of rejection. And this is how it does it. You see, we find ourselves drawing away from everybody all the time, and we become overly starved for acceptance. You see, and when we become overly starved for acceptance, we find ourselves going deeper and deeper down this rabbit hole of fear of rejection. King Saul could have been one of the greatest kings of all of Israel, but he was called out by the prophet Samuel for disobeying God's commands because Saul was an approval addict. He was living for the praise of others and letting what everybody else thought direct and define his life because what they think is really what has to happen even if I know it's wrong. Sound familiar? Sounds like work for some of you people, right? Like corporate America, my boss is crazy. He's losing the company money, but I have to do this this way because that's the way he says I have to do it. And if I don't do it this way, I'm going to get fired. But I'm not going to speak up because if I do, I'm afraid that he won't like me and it'll make things difficult at work. I hear that story all the time. You see, you're afraid of rejection. Rejection. And rejection gets us in the trap of being overly starved for acceptance. This is what Saul said. He said, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command. He said, I was afraid of the people, and so I gave in to them. He wanted acceptance from man and not God. See, approval addicts have an inability to confront. You don't want to rock the boat. You want people to like you, love you, and accept you, and so you're not going to do anything to confront someone. So sometimes that's exactly what somebody needs, someone that loves them enough to say, hey, I'm seeing something in you. we got to talk about this. Don't hate those people that come to you in love that want to talk about that stuff, by the way. Those strongholds that you struggle with when somebody tries to address that with you and you pull back and you say, hey, don't, don't you bother me about that. Guess what? That's an idol in your life. That's a first-rate sign. That is a red alarm that should go off in your mind and your heart that there's a stronghold that God wants to deal with when you get defensive about that sort of thing, the things that you know are destructive in your life. Rejection can do that. It can feed into that. Approval addicts have an inability to confront. Listen, approval addicts give in, but are inwardly angry and resentful sometimes. You ever been there? You're like, oh, I just I can't stand this situation. And you just gripe and complain to everybody else except for the person that can actually make a difference or change the decision, right? So not only are you dealing with this fear of rejection, but you're getting pulled into the sin of gossip as well because you're afraid to address these things with the person that can actually make a change. Am I preaching to somebody this morning? Come on now. I got to jump ahead. I got to jump ahead. Rejection. Listen, here's the other thing. Another trap from rejection is being overly cautious. And we can do this. We say things like, I've been hurt before. I'm not going to let anyone hurt me again. I'm not going to trust. I'm going to keep you at an arm's distance. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let you do to me what somebody else has already done to me. Does that sound familiar? See, that's what the fear of rejection will do. All right, we're going to have to jump ahead here. I, I'm going to go to the scripture, John chapter 12. This is, but because of the Pharisees, you see that? But because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. 
For they love praise from men more than praise from God. Literally, people that have found faith in Jesus didn't want to tell them about Jesus in the church that that actually belonged to Jesus because they feared being ostracized from their church, even though their church was wrong. Wow. See, that is what the fear of rejection will do. How do you overcome rejection? Again, these are going to be simple principles, but they're not easy. Number one, you say yes to pleasing God. God. Say yes to pleasing God. But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, he said, first seek the counsel of the Lord. His concern wasn't how they had always done things in the kingdom. It was that he wanted to please God. So when Jesus speaks to your heart, say yes to him. Let's jump ahead. Here's how, here's how you overcome the fear of rejection. You say no to pleasing people. Even when someone, you know what you're going to say to them could be hurtful to them because you know they're making the wrong decision and they want you to be party to it or they want you to approve it, be bold enough to not do that. If you see somebody throwing their life away or destroying their life and they want you to be party to that, woman up, man up, man. I say this to my kids sometimes, you know. It's, sometimes we just got to suck it up. You're like, well, that sounds kind of harsh. Well, it's true. Sometimes we do. Rub a little dirt in it and move forward here. Like you, you, We just have to take these steps to say no to pleasing people. Galatians 1.10 says, Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Am I trying to please men? If I were trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. And here's the goal, to get past the fear of rejection. You need to live for an audience of one. That is what your life is centered and focused around, pleasing Jesus, following Jesus' plan for your life, not letting it be dictated by everybody else around you, but being surrendered to that. Wherever your place of work is, whatever your family looks like, whatever your friendships look like, let Jesus get the first place in your heart and life. Live for an audience of one. Fear number two, this is one we all all deal with, is the fear of failure. Remember, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Here's how we overcome the fear of failure. First, you need to understand you will fail. If you don't, you're not trying anything. And Satan's got you exactly where he wants you in your life. Just not moving, not doing anything. Not of any use to be able to be used by God to impact somebody else's life because you're afraid to do anything to do that. If you step out to do something, odds are at some point in your life you will fail. It's going to happen. Let's all just go ahead and accept that into our hearts that there will be times and moments where we're going to fail at someone, something. And everybody, everybody fears failure. Remember the story of the parable of the talents. How, how there was one man went and took, he, took his talent and he buried it in the ground because he knew that the master was a hard man and he was afraid of the penalty that, that he would in, encounter if he lost that talent somehow, that, that, that precious thing. And so he buried it in the ground, and he brought it back to the master. Infuriated, the master said, you could have at least taken this to the bank and brought me the interest off of it. But instead, you took this precious thing, and you stuck it in the ground. And when I showed back up, you were like, here, look, here, it's for you. And in the same way, God is saying he wants the best of you to be used to make an impact in the world around you. Not to be held in, pushed away and buried in the ground. You will fail. And the Bible says it this way. It says, we all stumble in many ways in the book of James. If anyone has never been at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. Listen, here's the principle. When it comes to failure, you've got to allow yourself to feel disappointment, but not disapproval. You can be disappointed when you fail because you tried your best. And you failed. Guess what? That's going to happen. But don't look at failure in your life as like disapproval from others. Like, oh, shame on you. I can't believe you tried something and failed. Please. If somebody actually listened to that garbage, and if there's people like that that are speaking that sort of thing into you, you need to tune that out because we wouldn't have lights. We wouldn't have an automobile. I really like my refrigerator. That probably wouldn't exist either if somebody hadn't gotten out there and tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed and tried until all of a sudden something worked, right? Thank God for people that have the guts to get out there and try something different because they're going to change the world. These little kids, man, these little computer geeks that get out there at Tech Crunch Disrupt in Silicon Valley, I thank God for them. I do. And they all say, well, we're going to put our algorithm together and we're going to change the world. Maybe they won't this time. 
but it can happen. They don't all sound that way. So if you're watching online, please don't shut our website down. I know that you're smart enough to do that. You're a world changer. I thank God for people that are willing to try something, willing to step out and take a risk. That's one of the values, the core values of our church. It says that we swing for the fences, that we're going to dream big. We're going to believe God for so much more than we could ever expect. We're not going to insult him with these small little safe prayers or this tiny little vision. We might be a small church right now, but we are a small church with a mega vision, believing that God can use us now to impact the world around us. There's no limiting what he can do in and through his people. But you got to understand, you will fail. Here's the other thing. You can overcome. Listen, don't get stuck in the midst of failure. Understand that you can overcome. The Bible says, for though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. That's the difference. It's not that you fall down and stumble. It's that you keep getting up. Listen, a believer's attitude, if you're a Christ follower, it should either be I'm up or I'm getting back up. It's not I'm down. I'm down for the count. No, you're not. That is not the God that lives inside of you. Yeah, we might get knocked down every once in a while, but we're either standing or we're getting back up on our feet. You can overcome. Here's the third thing about the fear of failure. You must take faith risks. The Bible says, and without faith, it's impossible to please God. Let me say it this way. You can't play it safe and please God. That is not what he's called you to do. Have the hard conversation with somebody that you don't know how to engage. Be willing. Open your mouth and let the Holy Spirit do something through you that you couldn't ever do on your own. Who are you depending on? If you feel God leading you to do something and take a step, remember Peter in the boat. He felt God leading him. He had to take the step. There was no way that what he did he could have done on his own. Those are the kind of faith risks that God wants you to take. And for some of you, you're like, I could never talk to somebody about sharing my faith. Yes, you can. You know how you do it? You open your mouth and just try. You just tell it like you see it. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You don't have to have all the answers. But if you know that Jesus has done something to change you in your heart, you can talk about it. And it may be exactly what that person needs to hear in that moment that's going to be life-changing for them you got to take faith risks. You can't play it safe and please God. Listen, if you look back, if you look at the greatest fear in your life, most people would say this, the greatest fear in their life is failure. And if the greatest fear in your life is failure, and you let that drive every decision that you make, the greatest pain in your life is going to be regret. How do you want to live? You ever heard that old adage, when you look at a tombstone, there's a date, a dash, and a date, and the only thing that matters there is the dash. Are you going to let this drive you? Are you going to live a life that looks back in regret? Are you going to live a life that says, you know what, I'm going to take a faith leap because God is calling me to do that? The last one, i got to burn through this one. It's losing control. Losing control. Proverbs 12.25 says, an anxious heart weighs a man down. An anxious heart, you know what that is. You're rattled when things don't go as expected. You worry about things that are beyond your control. You lose sleep over pressing issues in your mind. It's hard to turn off your mind at night. You can't stop thinking. Your thoughts are just racing through your head all the time. The unknown intimidates you horribly, like stifles you. You often imagine the worst case scenario sometimes. That's the fear of losing control. And a lot of us deal with this. So here's how we walk through it. Here's how we're free from it. Number one, take your mind off the what ifs of fear. That is an unending journey. That is a rabbit hole that leads to a rabbit hole that leads to a rabbit hole that just, it, it never gets to Wonderland. I mean, it just drags you down. Stop dwelling in the what ifs of fear. The Bible says, make up your mind not to worry beforehand. Come on, right? Like, just don't do it. It's not worth your time or your effort. The bottom line is that worry never changes anything for good. So here's what you have to do. Here's, how, here's what you have to do. If you want to be free from the fear of losing control, you've got to put your mind on the promises of faith. The Bible says, you will keep him in perfect peace, him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. The last thing I tell you to be free from the fear of losing control is give your cares to God and don't take them back. 
you just keep putting them there at the foot of the cross. Let's pray. Hey, we're so glad you watched today's message online with us. We want you to know that if there's any other messages you'd like to see, you can check those out at peakcity.church forward slash messages. If you'd like to support the work that God's doing through Peak City, you can be a partner with us by heading over to peakcity.church forward slash give to give a tax deductible gift today. Thanks so much. We can't wait to connect with you again soon. Take care.